Welcome to Discerning the Drift with Addie Miller. Addie has spent years researching the influx of heresies coming into the church. She documents where Christians and Christianity have begun to hold hands with other religions such as Islam and the Catholic Church. How will all of this play in to the one world religion? How does all of this play in to Bible prophecy? Well, it's time to find out with your host, Addie Miller. It's time to discern the drift. Hello and welcome everyone. This is Addie Miller with Discerning the Drift Ministry Program. We thank you so much for joining us today and we will try and make this our very last program on uh, UFOs, ETs, and evolution. I'm going to wrap it up with a conversation about, um, specifically about theistic evolution. That's where we're going to, because that's where we have found that that uh, much of the ancient alien theory and uh, the belief in extraterrestrials or advanced civilizations on other planets is rooted. And it has uh, uh, consequences because much of what is being believed outside of the walls of Christendom has seeped in to the walls of Christendom under the banner of theistic evolution. Now, you, you might want to ask, well, where does theistic evolution even begin where well, there are a lot of threads that come together and tie themselves as one but we will talk about one specific origin of theistic evolution now thus far what we've done is we've learned of course through a biblical worldview that there is absolutely no advanced life or civilizations on other planets uh i think God's word, if you do a, an in-depth study and a, you have a biblical understanding, God's word supports that. There is an interdimensional world. Scripture supports that. And there is always, as there is today, been interdimensional uh, activity, spiritual activity. Now, UFOs, we've come to understand that UFOs and UFO sightings are 95 to 98% proven to be either natural or explainable. I think we've made our case for that in our previous programs. Uh, there are common occurrences in, in nature, and, and of course we have to not never, never, never rule out the advanced technology that uh, not only the United States has, but other countries have as well. Uh, just keep in mind, DARPA. Keep in mind DARPA if you want to do a little bit more research on something that's very, very interesting. Now, we've also found out that, that all of the ET messages parallel all religions other than except solid biblical Christianity. Unfortunately, many of the beliefs, uh, extra biblical beliefs, have seeped into Christendom. <clears throat> we've also come to understand that ET encounters are always associated with previous involvement with individuals who have been previously involved with or in the occult. That is one characteristic that never fails. Even non-Christian ufologists, people who have made it their life's work to investigate um, UFO encounters have admitted that the only group that is not represented in the, 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 the vast amount of people who have had encounters with ETs or, or uh, extraterrestrial beings or spiritual beings or out-of-body experience beings or telepathy, none of those people, none of those people were biblical Christians. So that tells us that uh, we are protected by what we believe in God's word. As biblical Christians, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He is our, our uh, earnest money, our down payment. He is our protector. And as we learn through God's word, his, that scripture is also the protector of the mind. Because we will also, we also saw that much of what 
these of how these encounters took pl took place was in the subconscious, in the conscious mind, in the mind. Many of many of it took place when people were uh, at asleep at night. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of them did. And so we know that many times it happens within the mind. And of course, the battle is within the mind. And then you have other people who had physical encounters where there were actual uh, uh, physical evidence that something had taken place on their person or in the surrounding area where they were. Uh, mystical experiences and false signs and wonders are always accompanied with these encounters. Very important to remember that. The messages all have similar teachings and beliefs. They're all promoting basically the same thing, maybe using different lingo, different phrasing. Of course, many times if you if you talk to people in other countries that are non-English speaking, the encounters happen in their language. So, but everything that they're talking about, all of the encounters and the messages that have been uh, shared by these ETs are extremely similar with the same uh, warnings. And they also have um, the same benevolent, of course, we put that in air quotes, benevolent um, uh, conversations about being here to help mankind. Uh, evolution. Evolution is a dominant belief, including theistic evolution, a belief that's becoming progressively, unfortunately, progressively uh, accepted within Christendom, as well as the acceptance of the possibility of any advanced civilizations on other planets. To have an advanced civilization on other planets, you have to believe in evolution, in other words, D Darwinian evolution, or here's where the jump happened. Satan made this jump from secular to spiritual when theistic evolution began to be what many uh, people within Christendom have started to accept. So we've done that so far. We've taken we've taken a little bit of time and we have set our our information in place where we understand that much of it is uh much of the beliefs today are uh explainable many of the beliefs today are uh um understood as being non-spiritual or nothing of any consequence but two to five percent or never have been explained. And those are the ones that we focused on because that's where the, 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 the spiritual deception comes in. And we have also made our case for the fact that this will be the understanding of those who are left behind at the rapture. This will be the understanding. They'll say, oh, well, we've been studying about UFOs and ancient aliens and and ETs for centuries. So this is what's this is what's happening. There's a cleansing of the earth that's taking place, and all of the non-believers or the troublemakers or those who are keeping us from 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 attaining our enlightenment as a planet or uh, keeping us from uh, reaching that that higher frequency have been removed. And of course, we talked about that, how there's the, you know, in the New Age movement, as well as in the, in ufology, they explained something about like an earth cleansing because they understood that they, they believe that the earth is a divine entity. Her name is Sophia or Gaia, and you can give her many, many names, Mother Earth. So we will address for our very last program we could go on into infinity because there's so much to share about this and of course things keep developing as we as we do our programs but we will finish with Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Delhard de Chardin he is the root the source of the acceptance of theistic evolution within Christendom. So we're going to talk a little bit about who he is, what he believes, I'm going to give a quote or two, and 
how this has permeated Christendom. And of course, as, as so many other um, uh, troubling beliefs, it has come through the Roman Catholic Church. And, and it, it so many of what we believe today within Christendom can be attributed to being dispersed by Roman Catholicism. So who is Pierre Delhard de Chardin? Well, he, of course, I said he is a Jesuit. He was a Jesuit because he was born in 1881 and he died in 1955. But he did much damage prior to that because you even have non-Catholics who are promoting Pierre Delhard de Chardin and all of his beliefs that are so erroneous that even there was a period of time, even within his own Holy Mother Church, that they uh, rejected him and what he was teaching. But he has since been reaccepted into the fold of the Roman Catholic Church. So from the Middle Ages, there was this darkness of, of spiritual understanding, and that had to do with the with the Roman Catholic Church putting the Bible on a list of forbidden books. So from that time period, there was this explosion and acceleration of myths and fables and sorceries, including ancient alien theory, including belief in ETs, intelligent beings on other planets. That was very prevalent during that time, predominantly coming through the Roman Catholic Church. And that was during the, between the 5th to the 14th centuries. So that people's minds just ran amok during that time. Why? Because they did not have God's word to help them to understand what to believe, what was biblical, what was of God, what was not, et cetera, et cetera. So it was there, there was just this explosion of a lot of teachings that were basically pagan. And it was because the people did not have God's word in their hands to be able to read. And if they did, they took their lives in their own hands just as they took God's word into their own hands. Now, Pierre Delhart Chardin was the greatest influence of theistic evolution. And it continues to permeate not only the Roman Catholic Church, but all of Christendom today. There's one book that he published, and it was entitled Theological Ethics Through a Multi-Species Lens, The Evolution of Wisdom, Volume 1. Then it was followed by Volume 2 and Volume 3. Volume 2 was Shadow Sophia, Evolution of of wisdom. There you go. Sophia, Holy Mother Earth. There, there can, the connection between sac the sacred feminine worship is happening all over the place today within Christendom. It started with, with uh, the worship of creation. It evolved into the worship of the planet as a feminine deity. Now you have all religions within Christendom and without Christendom have a feminine deity, some of them more than one. And what do you have within Christendom today? You have a feminine deity through the Roman Catholic Mary. And then you could go into Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox, which is just uh, the Roman Catholic Church without the Pope. So the sacred feminine is has a stronghold today within Christendom. Now, that's for another time. We're not going to discuss that today, but keep that connection in the back of your mind. The Roman Catholic Church is very open, and it is preparing for the arrival or the revealing of the space brothers or the space saviors. Many of them call them space saviors because what did they tell people? that have these encounters with them and that they communicate with. And, and it's all telepathically, by the way. 
They communicate. Who? What are they telling them? Even the apparitions are saying the exact same thing. The Marian apparitions are saying the exact same thing that the alien encounters, the ETs are saying, that they are here to help mankind, to not self-destruct, to protect the planet, to um, make that, uh, that evolutionary leap and so on and so forth. So they even, the Roman Catholic Church has even gone to the extreme that saying that they had a desire to baptize any of the uh, ETs or ancient alien brothers or sisters because we found out that there are women ETs as well in people's encounters. So the fem feminism has even infiltrated ancient alien theory, <laughs> which is not surprising. But we here can see that in 2014, the Pope said that he would be honored to baptize the aliens if they chose to reveal themselves. Why is that? Because he wants to make them Catholic. He wants to make them Roman Catholic. That's very important. If you study the, the history of the Roman Catholic Church and the Crusades and the Inquisitions, they would forcibly baptize people and claim that because they were baptized, they were now Roman Catholics, and they had to be under the authority of the Vatican. The Roman Catholic Church is very, very replacement theology. They believe that they have replaced Israel. I was taught that as a child, pre-Vatican II, when I was raised in the, the church, the Catholic Church that was, and the Mass was said in Latin. I was under the Council of Trent and Vatican I teachings at that time. It rejects the biblical rapture um, of the bride of Christ, but they will be open because they are open to a lot of new age and mystical and, and extraterrestrial beliefs, ancient alien beliefs. They will be open to this cleansing scenario when the genuine rapture of the genuine bride of Christ takes place. They will be all about that and they will promote it because they will say the space saviors came and took care of that. And that's all rooted in the acceptance of theistic evolution and of, and, and, and of scripture as primarily a book of myths and allegories. So if you, if, if, you know, people that are honest about the Roman Catholic Church, even if they're Catholic, you have to believe, you have to admit that your church is teaching that Genesis is a myth or an allegory. Jonah is a myth or an allegory. Well, where does it end? And who decides? Within the pages of scripture, well, they claim they have the authority to do that. Why do they have the authority? Because they believe incorrectly of the continuation of apostolic secession. So we have this theistic evolution that has come in through Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Delhard de Chardin. He was French, of course, a Jesuit priest, he was a philosopher a paleontologist, a geologist, and he was involved in the discovery, air quotes, because it turned out it was a hoax, of the Piltdown Man that was said to be approximately 150,000 years old. And later on, it was found out, it was revealed that it was all a hoax. Deschardins is also called, also known as the father of the New Age movement. He, con he, he conceived the idea of the Omega Point concept. This is the idea that everything in the universe is spiraling toward a unified point. And that parallels perfectly with the one world, the one world, the one world church, the one world religion, the one world uh, uh, bank, the one world government. But his primary understanding is the one world religion. That's what he calls the, um, the concept of the Omega point. 
where it all comes together and it's spiraling toward that unifying point, a final point of unification. There's your one world apostate church. He was condemned for much of his beliefs by the Roman Catholic Church prior to Vatican II. But after Vatican II, Deschardins, uh, once controversial, because they're not controversial anymore, beliefs are now being accepted and embraced, including the belief in theistic evolution. Deschardins had his encounter with the absolute, this is talking a little bit about his personal spiritual um, encounters. He had his encounter with the absolute, which is what he calls God, the absolute. During World War I, he wrote his first essay in 1916 called The Cosmic Life, revealing his personal mystical beliefs and his mystical living. Deschardins took the, the Jesuit solemn oath in France on May 26, 1918, an avid world traveler. In 1939, he wrote The Phenomenon of the Spirit and Spiritual Energy of Suffering. You have to remember, the Roman Catholic Church puts a lot of emphasis on personal suffering, not, pers not suffering that comes um, uh, with no... Uh, having nothing to do with you, what you caused. But they believe that if you bring suffering, you purposefully cause yourself to suffer, that you are helping to attain your personal salvation. Because remember, the Jesus of the Roman Catholic Church failed on the cross. Now, many times they won't say he failed, but they'll just say, oh, he did 99% and I have to do 1% through the sacraments and personal suffering. Self-imposed suffering. They're not talking about the general suffering of, of living in a fallen world. They're talking about self-imposed suffering so that you can add to what Jesus did for you on the cross. Chardin was all about that. The Jesuits per, uh, published and promoted all of De Chardin's controversial writings, while by 1962, the Pope and the Vatican were warning against the dangers of the writings of De Chardin. Now, you know, just a quick history the Jesuits were, were uh, founded by Ignatius of Loyola as a counter-reformation group to go out and get the people who were against Roman Catholicism or leaving Roman Catholicism in the 15, it was about 1538, 1540, when it was, uh, Loyola got this epiphany uh, on his deathbed or whatever he survived and he believed that he had to create this group that i call the, the the vatican mafia to go out and kill anyone who did not want to come back to holy mother church by any means so if you if you ever read and i'm not going to take time to read it because it, it's it's lengthy even in, in its shortened form the jesuit oath, oath you would be appalled by what they say is acceptable in other words, anything. They could do anything. They could kill anyone in any form, no matter if they were elderly or infants, and everybody in between. So the, the Jesuit oath, of course, many of them deny that, that, that this even exists, but it is indeed a reality. It's, it's vehemently denied by many. But so here you have Ignatius, who, who, who established the Society of Jesus, which is the Jesuits, and they were the ones who were sent out as uh, marauders to kill anyone who had who was denying the Roman Catholic Church. So he is called the father of the New Age movement. He conceived the the Omega Point concept. He is. Uh, he has had all of his work published by the Jesuits. But up until 1962, which is Vatican II was convened, there were there was no there was no one that was openly accepting of him. But he was still being promoted by the Jesuits. 
Since Vatican II, though, Deschardins' controversial teachings are now mainstream Roman Catholic. Deschardins abandoned the literal interpretations of creation in the book of Genesis, which the Roman Catholic Church has also done the same, in favor of allegory. And the Roman Catholic Church sees a lot of it as myth. And they say that they can make that decision because they are this, they have the, the apostolic secession, meaning that they, they believe that they can override scripture and reinterpret it as the centuries go on. They should have fully embraced theistic evolution. Now, theistic evolution basically is that God is the one who started evolution, and then he stepped back and he allowed it to develop. That's all theistic evolution is. It, they, all they did was put God as the, the one who initiated evolution. But then it, 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 it went forward without his assistance. And that was in uh, the 1920s that he considered it the center of his spirituality. That was the origin, the root, the basis for everything. Not God's word. It was theistic evolution. Deschardins, through the influence of Eastern mystical religions. Remember, he loved to travel. He makes me think a lot about, uh, a lot of, um, uh, when I read about him, of... Um, Scientology and LRH, L. Ron Hubbard, because L. Ron Hubbard traveled all over the world and picked up bits and pieces of all these religions all around the world. The predominant one was Hinduism, the same with Deschardins. So he, he, he was influenced by all these Eastern mystical religions, and he adhered to not only physical evolution, but spiritual evolution as well. So he began with a physical theistic evolution. Now he's talking, he went into the Omega point, which is the theistic spiritual evolution. And ultimately he says that the, the, the spiritual evolution of the, of consciousness will ultimately have union with God. And the cosmic Christ, which is that conversion that he was talking about at the Omega point. Deschardins further believed that all of creation was not will not be complete until each created being is totally united with God. So not only was he uh, was he a um, uh, a theistic evolutionist, but he was a pantheist as well, panentheist. And so he said that. We that that all of creation has to totally be united with God through Christ. Now you have to remember his Christ is not the his Christ is the cosmic Christ. It's not the biblical Christ. It's the cosmic Christ. Always know what people mean by the words that they use. In the pleroma, the pleroma, the pleroma is in the that that means the totality of your divine powers. It's a Gnostic concept. So there's another thread. Gnosticism. Again, the Omega point. Deschardins bases all of his mystical beliefs on misinterpretations of several scriptures, like Colossians 1, 15 through 17, 1 Corinthians 15 through 28, and so on and so forth. Deschardins has amalgamated old earth geology. This is why... Um, uh, what you believe, whether uh, new earth or old earth, you, that's very important. People say, well, you know, it's not really important if you believe it's the earth is old or if it's, you know, it's only 6,000 years old or it's, you know, 6 million years old. But it really does make a difference uh, uh, to what your your beliefs down the road are going to develop into. So he believed in old earth geology. Remember, he was a geologist. Uh, he, so he amalgamated old earth geology, paleontology, physical and cosmic spiritual evolution, and Gnostic Jesuitical Roman Catholicism, and then interpreted all of that through Eastern mystical thought. At one time, he, he was publicly disavowed, publicly, that was pre-Vatican II by the Roman Catholic Church, yet after Vatican II, Deschardins was applauded and promoted and quoted by the Roman Catholic hierarchy, specifically Joseph Ratzinger, who was Pope Benedict 
the 16th. He quoted Deschardins and spoke positively of him in his book, Introduction to Christianity and the Spirit of the Liturgy. You can look that up for yourself. Cardinal Avery Dulles in 2004 said, in his own poetic style, the French Jesuit Pierre Talhard de Chardin, pardon me, like to meditate on the Eucharist as the first fruits of the new creation. In an essay called The Monstrance, he describes how kneeling in prayer, he had a sensation that the host was beginning to grow until at last through the through this mysterious expansion, it just kept growing in size, the whole world had become incandescent and had itself become like a single giant host. So basically what he said is he saw the world become the Eucharistic host. It became divine. Worship the host, the Eucharistic host, you can worship the earth because in his opinion, it's all the same. So Deschardins correctly identified the connection between the Eucharist and the glorification of the cosmos. In other words, all is divine. God is all, God is in all. Cardinal Christoph Schornborn in 2007 wrote the following. Hardly anyone else has tried to bring together the knowledge of Christ and the idea of evolution as the scientist, paleontologist, and theologian, Jesuit priest, Father Pierre Delhard de Chardin has done. His fascinating vision has represented a great hope, the hope that faith in Christ and a sacrifice and, and a scientific, pardon me, a scientific approach to the world can be brought together. Now remember, when they talk about a the, a rep, rep, uh, the representation of Christ, faith in Christ, they're talking about the Eucharistic host. Now, just a side note, Vatican II initiated something called the New Evangelization. What was the center goal for the new evangelization? It was to get everyone in whatever religion, inside and outside, inside and outside of Christendom, to worship the Eucharistic host. It's all lining up, all of it. Now, uh, Darwinianism is the evolution that supports life on other planets, whether it's crude or advanced within secular society. But the theistic evolution supports life on other planets, crude or advanced, within Christendom. Never, you know, the corruption of man's thinking, even secular thinking, never stays in the secular world alone. It always infiltrates within Christendom. It has over the centuries, and it will continue to do so uh, uh, as long as the Lord tarries. That is uh, a given. Now, Deschardins was also involved in the, the, that 1912 Piltdown hoax and all of that kind of stuff. And it was said to have been, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. He was, it was, he was with some other men and all that kind of stuff. Well, it was found out that it was a hoax. So that should say something about who the man is. Like, why would he be a part of that? Even innocently, why would he be a part of that? Spiritual evolution is the evolution of the spirit, the soul, the mind, and the consciousness in partnership with the universal being, which is divine mind. This is AKA, also known as divine mind, divine force, divine presence, etc. Buddhism and all mystical religions, Roman Catholic monasticism, Hindu Vedanta, Zen Buddhism, Jewish Kabbalah, Islamic Sufism, all is included, can be included in this um, spiritual evolution. Deschardins uh, also proclaimed the following. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Now, I've heard that out of the mouths of people that I thought were biblical. And yet, they will quote, quote Jesuit Evolu theistic evolutionist Pierre Delhorch there sure did. There are four levels of spiritual evolution according to Deschardins. 
Animal primitive mind, which equals survival and the necessities and reproduction. Two, you enter a religion, a religion, any religion. Doesn't matter what religion, you know, because man is born with an innate need to worship something. He will either worship himself, he'll worship a rock, or he'll worship some deity that he has created in his own, made his own, in his own mind, created his own God and his own religion, or he will seek out the genuine creator God. And how do we know him? We know him through his word. Number, number uh, three, you do spirituality 101. You grow in whatever chosen religion you have decided, whether it's one you created yourself or one you adopted that has been created by someone else. And preferably, it would be the one created by the creator God and study of scripture. Number four, the beyond, which is enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, an awakening, a godlike, or becoming godlike, or becoming a god, or becoming one with God. All of this is rooting, it, rooted in the New Thought Theosophical Society of Helena Blavatsky. And that's a whole other program. We won't go into her. Very interesting character. Ufology has become the 21st century's new religion. Aliens will save mankind and the planet. Our E.T. brothers and sisters are our saviors now. And I think I made my point that many of the people who are promoting ancient alien theory claim to be Christians, which is mind-boggling. As the technology of humanity advances, the size, the shape, the message of the UFOs and E.T. encounters change also. That's very telling. So evolution, theistic evolution, is foundational to ancient alien theory. And the channeling of the space saviors is always interdimensional, many times simply happening within the mind. There's, that's a, they have the same evidence as, uh, and the stories as um, the Marian apparitions. If you compare those, it's fascinating. Just as in Chrislam, Mary, the Marian goddess devotion will take a central place in acceptance of ancient alien theory of visitors from other planets. Other dimensions as well, there are female aliens, what, and, and they're also uh, accompanying false signs and wonders. The, the manifestations of the Marian apparitions and the, the encounters, experiences are nearly identical, and the messages to the UFO encounters and experiences that people are having. The apparitions, the seers, the visionaries all experience very similar uh, manifestations as to the encounters and experiences of the UFO abductees. Compare the experiences of Roman Catholic mystics or any mystic from any religion, the one that I just named, such as Teresa of Avila and the alien abductees. Much of it is very erotic and it's very sexual. And I'm not going to go into detail about that. I'm going to let you do that on your own. The experiences can only be within the mind or externally interdimensional. Now, let me, let me share this, uh, these quotes real quickly to show you the, the, the common threads. Here's a Pierre Telhar Del, Desjardins quote. I can be saved only by becoming one with the universe. What I am proposing to do is to narrow the gap between pantheism and Christianity by bringing out what one might call the Christian soul of pantheism and or the pantheistic aspect of Christianity. So here's a, here's a quote real quick by Alice Bailey. In the reappearance of the Christ, the New Age matriarch Alice Bailey and her spirit guide, Dwal Kuhl, describe how the path to God will be based on an imminent God that is within every form of life. Here's the quote. A fresh orientation to divinity and to the acceptance of the fact of God transcendent and of God imminent within every form of life. These are the foundational truths upon which the world religion of the future will rest. There's just so many common threads. There's so many common teachings, common beliefs that it would take, in, we would have to go into infinity to compare them all. 
But there are so many similarities. All of us, here's one. All of us are little gods. We, you forgot that you're a god. Genesis 3. So that is one of the many messages that you hear about the, the being of the same divine essence, which is pantheism, very much like De, what Deschardins says and what um, uh, Alice Bailey says, what Blavatsky says, what many other aberrant religions within Christendom, Christendom are now saying. Uh, the same messages or cover such things as environmentalism. They have they have hints of Hinduism, Mormonism, spirit gods, Marian apparitions, angelic visitations, New Age beliefs. And there are so many people, te false teachers, that are bringing all of these teachings. And they will never say, uh, they will never let you know that this is from Hinduism. They'll make it sound like it's from God, the biblical God. That's where the deception comes in. All messages claim that man is divine or working his way to becoming divine. Creation is divine. God is, all is God, all is divine, all are one. Again, Genesis 3. Number two, the occult is always spoken of as good. They even tell the people that have the encounters with them, this is concluding apparitions, any mystical experiences, and UFO encounters, they even tell them to practice a lot of mystical methods and techniques so that they can get in touch with the divine within. Very common. Um, they, the UFO entities teach the contactees must develop psychic abilities and seek direction from the spirit world as well as abstain from certain foods and practice meditation that seek out channelers and palm readers and clairvoyants, etc. You, th you think about New Age veganism. You think about religions that tell you you have to, you are ordered, you are commanded to avoid certain foods for certain reasons. Not for, not for health reasons. It's for spiritual reasons. That's a common thread. Uh, if you talk about, if you, you want to go into the World Economic Forum with Klaus Schwab, he's trying to get people to all go meatless. Or these this, this meat that's being produced with all kinds of chemicals in it, in labs. See all the common threads? If you look hard enough and you know, you understand enough about what's going on, you can make those connecting threads. You can see that convergence taking place. Why would anyone need these mediators? And, and this question I have all the time in all my studies. Why would they need these mediators and mediative psychic abilities if the aliens are physical and highly evolved, evolved beings from a literal physical planet? They wouldn't. So this proves to you what they are telling their contactees to practice proves that they are interdimensional beings. They are spiritual beings not sentient, physical, evolved beings from another planet. Scripture labels these occult activities as an abomination. You can see that in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. Christianity is destroying the earth, according to them, by teaching uh, man had dominion over the earth when the earth is actually a living being to be worshipped. Pagan Gaia worship, Mother Earth. This is, you know, you you see the 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 uh, the fascination with with the 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 the, uh, the promoting of we have to save the planet and climate change and all of that. It's all spiritual, you know. I tell people you want to if you want to understand what somebody is believing, even in the secular world, you find out what they believe spiritually. And that will explain everything to you because everybody's beliefs, including mine, are rooted in what I believe spiritually, what I believe about God, who he is, who he's not, and who man is and who they are not. Study people's religious beliefs and it will explain to you everything about what they believe in life in general.
It never fails. Uh, number four, it also says Christianity is outdated. It, the extraterrestrial messages imply or say outright that Christianity, biblical Christianity, is outdated and false, and there is no such thing as sin. That's another common thread. Or they'll say, you have sin, and uh, this is what you have to do to overcome it. Fundamental Christianity, here's another, is wrong. Alien messages, now you could go, um, you know, your mind immediately goes back to, you know, Mormonism and, you know, you know those type of groups that consider themselves within the wall of Christendom. They say that Chris, that Chris, fundamental biblical Christianity is wrong. The alien messages claim that Jesus' actual message was to teach all of us that man can become Christ. Well, that's the same thing Oprah Winfrey teaches. She said Jesus didn't come, wasn't born and live to, to prove his deity, to tell us he was divine, but to tell us we were divine. That's what she says. The next one, number six, is the, the devil is good. Now, this is something called the demiurge, where, where the devil is the one who was, who was, was uh, caring for mankind, who loved mankind. He was a benevolent being, and he was the one that was trying to tell uh, Eve in the garden that, that God was keeping something from her, her divinity. And then that says that Yahweh God of Scripture, of, of Genesis, is the evil God because he was trying to keep Eve from knowing that she was divine. So alien messages say Lucifer is benevolent and he's the good entity. He came to free mankind and Yahweh is the malevolent being who came to keep mankind in bondage. This is a dominant belief in all non-Christian religious systems. The great serpent is found in all religions. If you want to see the, the deception in a lot in, in pagan religions and what seeped into Christ, Christendom, you look for icons and religious statues and pictures of a serpent that is seen as a good deity. It's very prevalent and um, very easy to see if you just look. All religions are the same according to the messages of the advanced space aliens or space brothers, except long-held biblical Christianity. They said you have to, you have to jettison that because that keeps you too narrow-minded. The extra extraterrestrial brothers and sisters uh, say that we are on the precipice of a grand leap forward in mankind's spiritual evolution. The ETs say to accomplish this leap, we must reject the old ways, which is which is uh, the fundamental biblical soul, biblical beliefs of uh, Christianity. We must reject the old ways of thinking about spirituality and acknowledge Jesus Christ as only one of many great teachers, including Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, Krishna, etc. The lie of physical evolution must be believed for the lie of spiritual evolution to advance. The lie of physical evolution must be believed for the lie of spiritual evolution to be advanced. Who are the individuals or groups where well, there are multitudes? I think we've gone into all of this. And uh, there are many without, outside of Christianity. But sadly, friends, there are more and more people within Christendom that are pushing mysticism, theistic evolution, etc. onto the people that are under their leadership. So it's very important that we understand that uh, we must compare everything to scripture. Scripture should be our plumb line. It should be our lens of investigation. Very important that we that we understand that. So I'm going to end with this. I have, like I said, there's so much more I could have shared with you, but I think it's time to end this topic, and we will be moving on to another topic. Now I just want to put in a little plug here. Uh, last hour, Bereans. 
2022 Prophecy Conference will be available online, I believe, by the end of mid to the end of March. Great topics, great speakers and teachers. Um, uh, if the Lord allows, I will be one of those. Uh, the, the topic that I shared with you on the last program that has just been a burden in my heart, and it just it's just been so heavy on me the last couple of years at least, I'm going to keep that topic for the conference, and I pray that you uh, make yourself available to it and uh, that you learn a lot of it and that you're blessed by it as well. So um, until then, I pray that you have an incredibly blessed day. Maranatha.